Jacob Priest-Mogg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When I was a child, I had a mug on it, which had the wonderful and famous lines, let the wealthy and great roll in splendour and state. I envy them not, I declare it. I eat my own lamb, my own chicken and ham. I share my own fleece and I wear it. I have lawns, I have bowers, I have fruits, I have flowers. The lark is my morning alarmer. So jolly boys now, let God speed the plough and long life and success to the farmer. That is what... Order, Joan Wally. On a point of order, Mr Deputy Speaker, having sat in here and come here today to support the bill of my right honourable friend from Stoke-on-Trent South and to introduce the second reading of my public body sustainable food bill on behalf of many hundreds and thousands of people around the UK who care about food, who do not want to have poetry recited in the House of Commons, who in the run-up to the 800 celebrations of the Magna Carta yeah. want this place to be dealing with real issues about sustainable food. Yeah. Is it not time that the business leaders of this House of Commons with Mr Speaker and you, Mr Deputy Speaker, find a way whereby bills like mine, which are not mischievous, which deserve to go into committee to be properly discussed in the interest of public health around this country, supported by organisations like Sustain, expect this House of Commons to give a proper hearing to the real debate. Yeah, 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 what yeah, can yeah, be done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I will bring her comments to the attention of Mr Speaker on Monday morning. I know how frustrating it can be on Private Members Day uh, when you have the second, third or fourth bill to be presented. I'm a veteran of Friday mornings and indeed I've had been fortunate enough to have several Private Members bills. One had fair win from the Government and sailed through, the others did not. And I know how frustrated she might be. The procedures we are following are set down in standing orders, and as I say, I will bring her comments to the attention of Mr Speaker uh, on Monday morning. Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Speech. Um, I do hope that he will confine his comments to the bill, and as interesting as the poetry was, that there will be no further repetitions. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would not, of course, wish to repeat the um, poem, but I think it brings to mind, reminds us of the importance of supporting farmers, that our countryside, as I said in an intervention to uh, the Honourable Member for Bury North, who made a quite brilliant speech earlier, uh, was made by God and the farmer. It wasn't made by bureaucrats in Westminster or in Whitehall. And it would be sad to see in this bill the final triumph of bureaucracy of the view that the man in Whitehall really knows best with a decision on a whole range of things, covering farming, covering agriculture, to be decided by one person in Whitehall rather than by the multifarious decisions of farmers across the world, and particularly in our own country. But let's look at every detail of this bill, every section of it, every part of it, and see what it really means. And when we do that, I think it divides very neatly into one of two things, two clear options for us to examine with regard to this bill. This bill could be retitled the Sustainable Livestock Motherhood and Apple Pie Bill, a bill that everybody agrees with and thinks is wonderful. And then there's a question in that of parliamentary procedure. Is it right for us to pass laws that don't actually do anything specific, but just talk vaguely about how nice the world could and should be if only we all clubbed together and rallied round and jollied along. I have great doubts about the seriousness of this as a proposition. We could go back to the motherhood and apple pie. I imagine apple pie would be the responsibility uh, of, of um, uh, DEFRA because it's food, and motherhood probably the Secretary of State for welfare. But this is really not how laws ought to be made. Laws should be dealing with specifics and with detail. They should have causes and consequences. Otherwise, we get into the position with this vagueness, this vagary, this randomness of our laws being decided in the courts. And so this bill, if it is merely an aspirational bill, 
oughtn't to be a bill at all. It shouldn't be coming before this House for debate in this sense. It should come at a general debate so people can say, yes, of course I want the rainforest to flourish. Yes, of course I want farming to be sustainable. Of course I want people to eat uh, British meat. I think if they've got any sense, they will buy their meat from Somerset. It is well known for providing the best and most glorious cuts of meat you could find anywhere in the world. Some people like Kobe beef. Personally, I think it's rather fatty, and you can get better beef from Somerset. It's the answer to most of our food problems. I want my eggs from Somerset, too. There's a, um, um, an egg factory, a poultry plant, uh, just um, uh, near Canesham in Burnet. And it's a wonderful place. I've been there. I've, I've visited them. And they have a small family operation committed to the highest standards of food production. But do I think there should be a law saying uh, that my uh, honourable friend from Ulster should only eat Somerset eggs? I, I think he would feel that that was a great imposition upon him and on his uh, fellow Ulstermen. And we know what Ulster says when it doesn't want to do something. It's usually no. And, and we, we really don't want this, this type of legislation. So what are we talking about? We're talking about public procurement of livestock produce. Well, is that just an aspiration? Because if it is, it's probably one that the government has anyway. So clause uh, 1-2-A of the uh, bill is before us is one that if it's aspirational is pointless because that's already the government's hope and aim. Um, providing appropriate public information and food labelling. And this is going to be a duty of the Secretary of State in relation to uh, sustainable livestock. I don't quite see the connection between the sustainability of the livestock and the suitability of the uh, labelling, that labelling and livestock are clean different things. And we're all in favour of honest labelling, and we've had terrible scare stories about chickens being injected with water and salt. Sounds a pretty ghastly combination, if you ask me. It doesn't happen to Somerset chickens, I can tell you. But if, if this is the case, of course they should be labelled as chicken, salt and water, rather than just as chicken. But that's a matter for the government to deal with through other means and other regulations, not, not through a vague responsibility for the Secretary of State. Um, sust sustainable livestock practices research. Where's the money coming from? We have sat in this House and listened to erudite speeches from all sides on how we are to cut expenditure, how we are to raise taxes, how we are to afford this enormous budget deficit that we have been left with by our socialist friends, and that this, this deficit that we have is not going to be magic to weigh abracadabra style by passing more costs onto Secretaries of State. We must be responsible, Mr Deputy Speaker, responsible for what we wish and how we go about getting it and the costs that we wish uh, to impose. Um, the food waste we've discussed earlier in a wonderful discussion about pigs and what they might uh, decide to eat. And I was hoping somebody might mention the Empress of Blandings, who was the only pig in history to win, win the silver medal at the Shropshire, Shre Shropshire Show uh, three years in succession. And the Empress of Blandings had a vast quantity of potatoes every day and was more than happy to eat waste food. But there is a risk in this, if we aren't careful, uh, that we go back to the risk we had before with um, the foot and mouth disease, which cost uh, the country, the taxpayer, Her Majesty's Government, uh, billions of pounds to put right. So I think there has to be some sensible balance as to what we do uh, in dealing with food waste. Privilege and honour. Um, I, I can understand that uh, it's necessary to reduce the amount of food waste, but would my honourable friend like to... Um, inform the House what he thinks could possibly be meant by finding sustainable methods for the use and disposable of food waste. Uh, um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Sustainable methods for food waste conjure up all sorts of nasty uh, thoughts that um, in the 19th century there were people who went round collecting what was politely described as night soil, and the night soil was then taken uh, to the farms and put on the farms and used as a fertiliser. And night soil was replaced by guano, which is um, the same thing, really, but from seagulls, uh, and made a great deal of money for one particular family who actually live in North Somerset rather than North East uh, Somerset. So I, I think you're right to conjure up some thoughts and uh, horrors about what might be done with this recycling of food. And really, I don't think we want to go back to the days of people going around collecting night soil. I, I, I think um, 
uh, Mr. Basil Jett and the sewage system that was installed uh, in the 19th century is better capable of dealing with some uh, waste products uh, than perhaps um, uh, the means suggested potentially by this bill. And then the changing of subsidies available to and support for farmers. Again, I come back to my question, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Is this sort of parliamentary wallpaper, the wish list of what we want, or is it serious business? I doubt there's an honourable member, an honourable friend, a right honourable member, a right honourable friend, a honourable and gallant ones either, who don't want to see some reform of the common agricultural policy and the change to the subsidy system that seems to make it cheap for the French to produce food and comes down on our farmers like a ton of bricks. I think there's a uniform view that this should happen, but there is one grand obstacle. In spite of the entente cordiale, it's entente cordiale as long as it's not about agriculture. And as soon as it's about agriculture, we're back to Agincourt and Cressy. And I won't go on about Agincourt and Cressy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because I, though I know uh, those two battles are particular favourites of yours, I feel they're not immediately pertinent to the bill. But the behaviour of the French, the behaviour of the French in matters of agriculture is, and if we think of the French, we only have to think of the riots we had the other day, because French students do that day in, day out. And if we do anything about subsidies... <laughs> I think we're now going very wide of this particular <laughs> bill. If he could actually bring his comments back to the contents of the bill, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I was on the point of subsidies and how we can't do what the bill is saying because the French won't let us and they will take to the streets if we try and attack subsidies uh, across the European spectrum. Much, though, people in this country, ministers, even prime ministers with all the authority that prime ministers have, have not been able to wean the French off their subsidies. We may share a navy with them, but we find it difficult to share subsidies uh, so easily. And then the Minister will have a duty to look at the effectiveness of existing programmes. Well, I have to say, if the uh, Minister isn't looking at the effectiveness of existing programmes already, he's an idler, and he shouldn't be doing this. And I know that the Minister is far from being an idler. He's one of the most assiduous Ministers in Her Majesty's Government is well known for this and is the friend of the farmers. And therefore, of course, he's going to be doing this already. So we're back to this grand and jolly wish list of nice-to-do things. But let's just review Section 1, the duties of the Secretary of State, 1 and 2, as if it's not a wish list. Because that, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the frightening alternative. If it's grand and good and fine and dandy, it shouldn't be a bill. But if it's real and costed and expensive and a burden on farmers then we should oppose it as a bill, because it would be ruinous for our agriculture. Our farmers have had a terribly difficult time in recent years. They have had a subsidy system that has changed. They have been hit by various disasters, none of them the fault of governments particularly, but disasters nonetheless. TB in cattle has devastated dairy farming in northeast Somerset, where there used to be field after field full of cattle. They've gone. They've gone out of business. Where there were ten dairy farmers, there are now one, or if you're lucky, two. And that's partly been TB, it was partly foot and mouth, it's partly milk quotas, it's partly regulation. And are we now to say to these few farmers who have continued, who have strived, who have worked hard, that all their effort is in vain because though they were scourged with whips before, now they will be scourged with scorpions? And perhaps this bill should be renamed the Scorpions Bill for that purpose. Because if it's serious in its purpose, purpose and its purport, then it would be very bad for our farmers indeed. It would place these extra rules upon them. It would make their practices subject to a higher standard of rules than any others. I already mentioned the chicken farmer in North East Somerset at Burnet and that fine family who attend to their chickens there. They are outcompeted day in, day out by Thai production. Now you may think that Thai eggs are not really what you want. You may feel that Thai chicken is not your cup of tea. It's not mine, certainly. It tends to be a bit spicy. But we do not want to add further regulations on farmers in North East Somerset, or in Ulster, or in Scotland, or in Wales, or in the whole of the rest of England, even in Gloucestershire. We don't want to attach these regulations on our farmers that will put them out of business. And what will it do? It will do nothing but help the foreign farmer, and particularly our European friends and sometimes allies. Outrage. Thank you. I appreciate that sedentary comment of outrage from 
uh, my honourable friend. Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, issues, if it's real. And that applies also to increasingly onerous tests on food labelling. We already have bonkers food labelling regulations uh, from the European Union, so that if you buy a Parma ham and chop it up um, in Westminster, for example, you can't then sell it as Parma ham because the EU is so protective on its food labelling for its friends that there are very limited things that you can do. And we don't have a system for our farmers that is that onerous, and nor should it be really. We need to have a sensible balance that keeps farmers in business and doesn't overregulate them and destroy their livelihoods. And the subsidies issue is an important one. If you look at subsidies, if we really were going to change them, we must change them on a fair basis. When I was a candidate in Shropshire, in the Rekin, there was um, a sugar processing plant. And the French decided, when they held the presidency of the European Union, that they would change the subsidies for sugar beet production. And they abandoned it as soon as they stopped uh, holding the presidency, not perhaps surprisingly. But this uh, subsidy was used as a basis for people to make long-term investment decisions. And it's therefore very unfair if the government turns around and says the subsidy we gave you today and promised would be there forever is gone tomorrow, because then businesses cannot invest. Now, I'm against subsidies in principle. I think we want to get to free trade within ag agriculture. I think it's a tremendously important ambition, but that we have to do it in a staged process because, like alcoholics, you cannot necessarily wean them off the bottle straight away, and you cannot wean industry off subsidies overnight because they have expected them for the investment decisions that they have made reasonably and rationally, and it is tremendously important that long-term decisions are made. Of course. The uh, question of subsidies, is my honourable friend aware of the NFU's position and view that in order to encourage arable farmers to switch production to protein crops, uh, they estimate that they would need to be incentivised by at least £100 to £200 per hectare? I thank my honourable friend from Berry North for another invaluable contribution to this debate. I had indeed seen the National Farmers Union's uh, briefing and this extent, expensive uh, process that would come about if some of this were done. We can't afford an extra 100 to 200 pounds uh, to subsidise farming. We need to come down on all forms of public expenditure and bills that propose more expenditure are rotten bills if they're real bills. So on my second half of this point, the first half, you remember, Mr Deputy Speaker, was on whether it was just wallpaper. But on the second point, if it's real, we can't afford it. But nor can the British people afford it. I want to stand up for the British consumer, who never seems to get a look in. We never seem to talk about the fact that having cheap meat is great. It improves people's standard of living. They can afford to buy food that used to be the preserve of the wealthy that the fact that more people eat meat today than ever before is good. And the fact that it's done is because people are more prosperous, but also because meat is cheaper. So when we look at uh, Section 4, the Secretary of State has a duty to ensure that the steps taken in accordance with this Act do not lead to an increase in the proportion of meat consumed in the United Kingdom which is imported. If that is in fact rank protectionism, we should treat it with the deepest suspicion. This House was much divided over the Corn Laws, and the argument for the Corn Laws was cheap bread. The argument against this bill may well be cheap meat, and I want to see the shoppers of North East Somerset able to get access to affordable meat, to good quality meat, and not, have, not to have the wealthy and great telling them that they can't afford that meat and that they must only have vegetables or something terrible like that, because yeah, most people yeah, don't really yeah. like vegetables, particularly um, uh, people who are meat eaters, yeah. and those of us who are meat eaters would do with a few chips on the side, but we yeah, really yeah, don't yeah, want yeah. to be forced by members opposite to eat our greens, whether they be cauliflower or cabbages, whether it be spinach or marrows, whether it be turnips yeah, yeah. or any, or carrots, I must say I particularly dislike carrots. And I remember George Bush Sr. got in terrible trouble. Order, order. <laughs> Debate to be resumed what day? Friday the 10th of June 2011. Friday the 10th of June 2011. Public body sustainable food bill, second reading. Not moved. No. Object. 
Uh, objection taken. Second reading, what today? Friday, 21st of January, Mr Deputy. Friday, the 21st of January. Freedom of Information Amendment Bill, second reading. Object. Objection taken. Second reading, what day? Uh, 21st of January. 21st of January. Safety of Medicines Bill, second reading. Beg to move. Object. Objection taken. Second reading, what day? 19th of November, sir. 19th of November. I beg to move that this House be now adjourned. Uh, point of order, Sean Wally. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. Can I simply say to the House that the number of objections that we've had to valid private members' bills, once again, I believe, brings the whole business of the House yeah, and the way yeah, it is yeah, run yeah, yeah, as to yeah. whether or not it is fit for purpose into debate and that this is a matter which urgently needs to be discussed with the Leader of the House. Yeah. Um, I, I have nothing to add to that point of order other than what I said uh, earlier on. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Jim Dowd. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed.